One of the occupational hazards of hanging out at a tank museum is if you stay near the German vehicles long enough, you might run over this guy, Hilary Doyle. If you don't know the name, you should, because whenever I do the research for these, it's his books that I tend to use. He's been known to work with Tom Yance, Walter Spielberger, and uh, I'm not joking about the tripping over. I mean, the first time I ran into you, you were hiding underneath the Pack yeah. 40, measuring it. Easy. Yeah. You've been doing this longer than I've been alive. Yeah, my first publication was 1964. Yeah, this gray hair, I've been around a while, so he's been around a very, <laughs> no offense, no. you've been around a very long time. So we figure what we'll do is something slightly different on this tour, is we're going to steal his knowledge and expertise as we tour around this Panzer IV at the Panzer Museum in Munster. Okay, so where does the story of the Panzer IV start? Like the Begleitwagen, is that it? The, the Begleitwagen means uh, support vehicle. And uh, it, the Panzer IV was just that. It was a support vehicle. And the Panzer IV provided artillery fire, effectively close-in artillery fire for those Panzer units using the Panzer Threes, Panzer Twos, and Panzer Ones. It wasn't meant to be a direct combat tank itself, but it evolved into a combat tank because the long gun was needed and the other tanks didn't have the capability of taking the, that in their turret ring. But then we do have a vehicle that was effectively designed in 1937 or yep. earlier, and it's still a viable tank in 1945. Yes, it was uh, being produced in quite substantial numbers in 1945. All right, so this specific vehicle, what is and what's its history? Well, um, this is a um, about the 100th vehicle, Panzer IV, produced by a company called Fomag. And this specific vehicle was produced about September of 1942. And on the 21st of October uh, 1942, it landed in Tripoli in North Africa. Hence the tan color, the Deutsches Afrika Corps. And if you're wondering about the black, I'm sorry, I've been informed by the Russian crew that it must be blocked <laughs> off. Don't ask. Uh, so North Africa lands. North Africa. Then what? I don't know anything about the, the specific history of the of the vehicle, how what had happened, but the British captured it. Okay. And so this was the first Mark IV special, basically, that the people saw in England. Correct. Yeah. The, the English were calling these Mark IV specials because it was the first time they had seen this long gun on a Panzer IV. Prior to that, it was a short. Uh, gun, but they said this is being manufactured as a production vehicle. There's many, many improvements, small manufacturing improvements in it, and there's lots of improvements in the fighting capability of it. All right. Well, that's the overview. So what we're going to do now is we're going to start doing the traditional tour of the various components, and well, we'll see what makes the Mark IV special yeah. so special. Okay, so now we're going to have a look at the front slope as ever. And, uh, well, the most obvious thing, of course, are the spare track links. And now, usually I see them on the actual bow itself. Is this normal or...? Uh, well, in, in this period, they didn't carry them at the front. Yeah. It was, this was the only place that there were spare tracks and some on, a few links on the side. This was a later innovation to put them in there as an additional protection so that a round would hit the track first before it would hit the main armor. Hmm. Did it work? Moderate. <laughs> okay. It made the guys feel better. Ah, well, that's, if, that's again, half if the you, thing. That is. All right, so you start off on the right, you got that no tech shrouded light yes. that, that shows up everywhere. Uh, no tech is just the name of the manufacturer. No tech is uh, a Nova technology uh, company, and they design these so that you get the light only shining downwards at the front, and the second part of it is at the back. Hmm. Horn is next thing inboard? Yeah, just a standard. Automobile horn from Bosch. All right. Uh, so then we got the access ports for the steering and transmission, which are actually easy enough to open up here. And I am looking at, it looks like two very large brakes. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, for the transmission system, which the gearbox is in the middle, and the drive goes to the brakes here for braking the track and out to the final drive unit bolted on the outside of the vehicle. It's a simple sort of clutch brake system? Yeah. All right. So no neutral steer on this thing yet. 
1930s. Yep. And the, you said the transmission will come out of this hatch here. In the center, yeah. Uh, so easier to change in the field than the earlier vehicles then. Yes. All right, so bow machine gun, no surprises there. We've already covered the sloped armor. It is welded, uh, of course, which was fairly advanced for the time. A lot of other countries were still doing riveting. Correct, yeah. Well, the Germans had uh, decided on welding right back at the very beginning in, in the late 20s that they were going to go for welding to save weight. Uh, were they actually better technologically at welding than other countries? Yes, or was they it just were way ahead, they way were. ahead. And even sometimes they uh, wouldn't export the welded vehicles in case people would examine the welding. Hmm. Face hardened or yes, standard? all face hardened. All face hardened. Okay, and well, really not much else at the front. We've covered. Well, we'll go back to the bow machine gun and the driver's position a little later. Uh, just the towing hooks are not the ones that I'm used to seeing, like on the Panzer III with the big loop around. Yeah. Uh, that's part of the side armor. Yeah, but the Panzer IV, being a support tank, had originally only 20 millimeter armor, and up to the Ausfrung E. This is an Ausfrung G, but the, even up to the Ausfrung F, this was uh, 20, and then it went to 30, and it, with 30, you can have the extension on the side. That was finally introduced in uh, the Ausfrung J on the Panzer IV, but that was not till 44. Okay, well, let's go around that side and have a look at the suspension. All right, so coming around to the side of the vehicle, I now get Hillary grilled on one of life's great mysteries. So, I mean, if we were to assume that torsion bar suspension is better, because that's what pretty much everybody's using, and they had already figured it out in the Panzer III, explain this. Well, uh, the designer of this vehicle was Krupp and Krupp had vast experience in the railway business. So they knew that these leaf springs were very successful, very inexpensive to produce, easy to maintain. You could remove a whole bogey relatively quickly and replace it. It was a good system. It wasn't meant for high-speed combat vehicle. It's a support tank. Well, not anymore, it's not. Not anymore, but then you live with the suspension not being quite as good as torsion bars. Do they try to fit oh, them Oh yes, there was many ideas. Uh, there was a big design effort put into producing a torsion bar version. There was many changes to the suspension, but none of them ever implemented because they had moved to the Panther design. It's a bit like the sloped armor on the Panzer IV then. Yes, exactly. This was, the final version of this was meant to have sloped armor, but they never implemented that. It, they just wanted to produce large numbers of them. All right, let's move on then to the track on four return rollers, still using the rubber. Simple tracks, sing, single pin. A uh, single pin track, yes. And, and But this uh, model, well, the Ausfrung F, uh, would have been the first one that had regularly gone to this wider track. It may not look it, but this is 400 uh, millimeter wide. You measure across the pins to get the width. The previous models, the Ausfrung E and earlier, were all um, 38 uh, centimeter wide track. And on these, these ones, the wheels are actually wider this way than they would have been with the previous model, the Ausfrung and it'll be the same with the sprocket wheel? Oh yeah, everything is, is moved out to, to compensate for the extra width. It gives it better, better flotation, but still rather narrow track by uh, the style you saw on uh, Panther or Tiger. I've been asked a couple of times, what is this thing? Well, that's quite important because that's actually the exhaust, sy uh, exhaust system for air that has been drawn from the steering brakes, which we looked at when you flip open the hatch, you've got the steering brakes there. So when they're being used, a lot of heat gets built up in those. So the heat is drawn away and fumes from the, um, from the plates pushing together. And so that's drawn uh, with a fan and pumped out through here. So it's been ducted by, by Ducted pipes. by a series of pipes. The pipes are actually driven off the back end of the gearbox and out. I'm sure across. we'll see them inside yeah. then. All right. Arguably, I would say the German military's greatest contribution to army technology in World War II and probably the most underrated, the jerry can. Yeah. Any idea who came up with it? I don't know the history. I mean, there are specialists who've written books just about the jerry can, uh, but it is a very important design. It's a very clever idea that allows you to use every last drop of whatever is it, liquid is in the can, and they don't get damaged easily. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that there's even a, a, a design behind the handles. 
So you can carry one in the middle or you can carry two side by side by joining the two handles together. Incredibly versatile. We've been using them ever since. Yeah, and you could lock the, you, you, when you flip the cap open, there's a pin that locks the cap open so it's not closing on you. Handy enough. All right, anything else uh, of note to the suspension or the side you think is worth mentioning upon? Well, I mean, on, the, on this model, you have the bump stops uh, for each of the units because, again, we talked about the bumpiness of this type of suspension. So there's a bump stop for each one. And at this time, in uh, 1942, they were still using a casting for that bump stop. Later, they went to a much simpler uh, welded uh, arrangement for the bump stop. And of course, in time, in the uh, Ausrung H, they replaced the rubber uh, return rollers with a steel return roller. They, uh, were, the big problem was rubber was uh, an issue as well as fuel. All right, so this visor went away over time. Yes. Within a week or two of the, of the production of this particular tank, the turrets being delivered would have had no opening for the visor. Turrets are being delivered? Yes, they're being delivered. Uh, the, so the, this uh, was made by Vomag, but not the, made by This Vomag. was assembled by Vomag. The turrets, the superstructure, the hull, was made by armor suppliers who actually welded the whole thing together. So you had all the different manufacturers creating the same components sometimes. Well, usually there was a couple of manufacturers for each component. So in the case of um, armor components like the turret, the superstructure and the hull, they were coming from usually three different steel factories. In this case, this is from the, uh, the steel in, used in this particular tank is coming from uh, Buller in Austria in Linz. Okay, so a maintenance guy in uh, Eastern Europe decides his Vomag Panzer IV needs a spare part for, and the box that he opens up is made by Krupp. No particular problem. I know, the smaller spare parts would be pretty standardized. It's more the bigger bits or the unimportant pieces that would be non-standard. And even then, they might be only slightly non-standard. So you can chuck it away and put it, a new one on. Fair enough. Right, I think that about covers the side of it. So, well, let's go back. So we were at the back of the tank. Some people would say the most important part of the tank because the engine is the weapon. And uh, there is a thing in my videos, I always love talking about track tension in the idler wheel. People mock me for it. I think it's a very important part of track maintenance given how often you do it. But uh, so the idler wheel on this looks a little bit different. Yeah, uh, the, when the British uh, made the report on this vehicle, they were most uh, interested in the change in the idler because the previous one had been made with uh, plates of metal welded together. This one is welded together with tubes and that seemed to impress them greatly. The actual idling, uh, the, the tensioning is done uh, because you just remove this cap here You've got two lock spanners and then a big bar with a threaded top on it and everybody leans on that and that pulls the, the idler further out. Well, moving a little bit further inboard, okay, towing hooks, we've got this little port here for a starter. That's for the, uh, that's actually for the control to, to fire the inertia starter. An inertia starter is done because you get the, you get the hand crank and you wind the spring in there, okay. Of the, of the inertia starter up to a, a particular tension and then it's ready to go. And then when, when everything is set up, you, you open the hatch, pull the lever and, or turn the lever and away goes the inertia starter to get the motor running. So speaking of sticking things in the back, and the, uh, on the Russian front frequently you'd hear stories about how it is so cold that you need to use flames to either melt the snow around the tracks or put a flame inside the motor compartment to start yeah. it up. Um, this problem of very cold weather starting, uh, when they encountered this first, the solution was not the, the flame one, but actually inside there is a whole set of new pipework in this that wasn't on the previous models that allows you to flip the engine compartment open and connect up the hoses from another tank with its engine running and transfer the hot cooling, cooling water from that tank into this one. But that was a cooling transfer system um, which they kept for quite a long time. But then in 43, um, Dr. Fuchs came up with this idea of having a, a, 
system in here where you can put a blow lamp on the outside and heat the, the tank's own cooling water uh, from the outside with the little paraffin blow lamp. So that was quicker and... Well, it's a cheaper and easier solution than flipping the engines and having everybody running and so forth. All right, so a huge muffler, and they existed many years before. Uh, we have the towing point and a bucket on the tow. I've always wondered, what do you do with the bucket? Uh, I don't know. Somebody took a picture of a, of a, a panther, I think it was, with the bucket on the back, and ever since there's been buckets appearing on these things. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is, I presume, a protector from the That's muffler a protector, system? The, the actual exhaust from the Maybach are coming out on either side, one from either side. That's where the motor is, actually. There's the, the exhaust pipes are in line with the motor. All right, so this would be? That's the auxiliary uh, motor for driving the electrical generator, which powers the, power, the electrical power traverse for the turret, and of course, supplies power to the batteries and for the radios and so forth. And you had mentioned the Notex, so that's the back end of it. Yeah, this is a very clever uh, convoy light system um, where you have the four lights. When the guy coming from the back sees four lights, he knows he's too close. If he moves a little bit further back, he'll only actually see two. One, two I, uh, these two come together in his eyesight. He knows he's at the right position. And then if he sees just one light, he knows he's too far and he has to close up. Push the gas pedal. All right, so I just want to tell you this, uh, you've got this sort of inward slope and that's one of the grills. Well, that's very important because that's actually the air intake. And the air intake comes in through here, takes in the air, runs it across the engine compartment, across the auxiliary generator, through the engine compartment. And there's a series of radiators that are at an angle down that side and the hot air is then blown out through the grill on this side. So no air is drawn through the louvers that are no, cut they the were, top? No, they were a modification for the tropen to give just an extra amount of ventilation in the engine compartment. All right, so this all, of course, revolves around the Maybach 120. Yeah. Maybach have been making engines since the, the 1B, give or take. Yes. How did Maybach get corner of the market on Panzer engines? Well, they won, they won a contract um, because they had a series of engines which were technologically similar. And the main feature of Maybach engines also is they're very compact. So unlike, say, an Allied engine, very famous engines like the Rolls-Royce engines are much longer. Uh, the Maybach engines are very compact, which means that's why you get a stubby little engine compartment at the back here. And therefore, you don't have to put in extra armor to protect the engine. So it basically it reduces the weight overall. Smaller engine, smaller volume, smaller weight. Yet the weight on this thing kept going up. I mean, you start off with about 18 tons on an Avs B, and by the time you finish up, I mean, this is 23 tons. This one's probably tons. about 23 tons, and then the final one would have been about 25. But the, the you had the same engine pump, pumping out the same horsepower, basically. Yes. Yeah, they, they, the, some of the gear ratios were modified, but the main change was on the final drives. Uh, they, they strengthened those and they uh, changed the gear ratio on the final drive. That's really about the only serious change. Okay, so it's all of course done by the fuel system. We've already mentioned the two tanks are in the middle, about uh, 470 liters, I think it was. And then you had the J model gave you extra gas. Yes, because you, you didn't need the auxiliary motor. So you've got a spare space in the engine compartment and that they used to put an extra fuel tank in there. All right, so done with the engine deck. Quick view of the back of the turret. Huge stowage bin. The Germans seem to love the stowage bins and I have to say, I appreciate it. Have some well, that came from, it. actually, that came from troop demand because all these original Panzer IVs or Panzer threes didn't have that bin on them. Um, but then with the campaigns and so forth, there was a demand for a bin and some units made their own bins um, and then it became standardized. Uh, so there was a standard bin for a Panzer IV and a standard bin for a Panzer III. All right, so last question. I mean, I'm looking at a nice flat engine deck. So sleeping quarters? They spent a lot of the time inside the vehicle. Each one had his own little place in there and they made it as comfy as they could but if the weather was okay they got out and slept out underneath or wherever i've spoken to people about that and they said that it just depended on the conditions where they where they bunked down 
All right, well, that's the end of the back of the tank. Uh, what we're going to do is come back in part two when Hillary and myself are going to squeeze inside and uh, we'll continue asking him a few more questions. I'll see you then. Greetings, lads and lasses. All right, for those of you that haven't yet figured it out, Inside the Chieftain's Hatch was conceived as an advertising mechanism for World of Tanks, the game. And, well, it's uh, about time to verify whether or not this is actually working for the bean counters. So I know a lot of you don't yet play the game. Well, here's the thing, it's free to play. And if you look in the text description down underneath the video here, you're going to see some instructions on how to access the game and attribute the game to uh, these videos. And as I say, it's free, so give it a go, download it, look at the vehicles in the garage, hit the tech tree in preview, play a few games. If you don't like it, uninstall, no harm done, hasn't cost you a dime. If you do like it, well, congratulations, you found yourself a new time waster while you wait for part two of this vehicle to show up. See you there. You haven't heard any stories about you know, tank troops waking up and going into battle and all of a sudden Scorpion starts crawling on their neck or anything? I, I haven't. No? No, <laughs> no veterans we, told we, me that. I'm sure it would happen. We have, we have things in Iraq, they're called camel spiders. And they're harmless officially, but they don't look it. I mean, the evil, vicious thing, you see one, ah! <laughs> Many rounds were expended that day. <laughs>